Awesome. All right. I'm Paige. I'm an alcoholic. I also realized that when I start my big book study, I always start it with awesome. So this is just a big book compendium thing. Awesome. That's how I rock and roll. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be the last minute sort of fill-in speaker. And I'm not being sarcastic. I genuinely love uh, being able to step in and be of service. And it's it's a privilege to, to show up and be of service. And so I was asked to speak on step 11. Now, I, basically, Steve said he could listen to me all day. So what that means is I don't have a stop time. I'll just keep going all day. I'm kidding. I will do it about 40 minutes like I was like it is implied that I do. I'll wrap it up. But uh, let's talk about step 11. So I, I always like to bounce around in the book and bounce out of the book and, and talk about what the directions are in the book. And so let's hop over to fi page 59 just to see uh, what step 11 says as written on page 59. And at the bottom of very, very bottom of page 59 is step 11. And it says sought. And the word sought is a conjugation. We we're talking about uh, vocabulary. Uh, and uh, how our vocabulary has expanded beyond five swear words uh, since coming to 12-step recovery. But the word sought is a conjugation of seek. And what I'm here in 12-step to do is to seek. What I am after is to seek an experience. And I don't know about you guys, but I'll share with you my experience. My experience is I couldn't stay well in one drink. I couldn't stay well on one drug. I couldn't stay well on one compulsive action. I cannot stay well on one experience, but that is what I'm after. I'm seeking an experience, but I got, I get to keep seeking. It says sought. It doesn't say sought until you are perfect, which is rude because doesn't it know I've arrived. I've not arrived. Deeply flawed, frequently wrong. That's me. Uh, we're talking about that before the meeting as well. So seek. And what I want to point out about that is there is not a glass ceiling on seek. It is not seek until we are found. What, I, what I'm doing in this way of life is it, it talks about the road of happy destiny. It talks about the broad highway, not the broad vacation destination. I have to continue to seek. I'm never done. Now it says sought through prayer and meditation. Anyone here ever uh, read that as sought through prayer or meditation? I know I did that for a long time. You know, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do the one that I want to do. It's never meditation. Often when I'm sitting with sponsees and I ask them about their prayer and meditation life, they always say, yeah, yeah, I'm praying sort of, but, but it's meditation. And at least that was my experience that meditation was the spiritual action that, man, I hadn't even picked up. And then I, I had really uh, set off to the side and you know, I was going to talk about this a li little later on, but God or my ADHD has moved me in this direction. So I'm going to go on, off on this little tangent. One of the places uh, in step in step two in the chapter we agnostic, a lot of what it's encouraging me to do is to lay aside my old ideas, lay aside my prejudices, lay aside my preconceived notions of what things mean. And one of the most common places that I have found that the people that I work with myself and and you know, just where I found a lot of old ideas exist is in the concept of meditation. Anyone here, and like, I, I, all, I don't want to say, we don't have to do a show of hands. This doesn't have to be audience participation. Steve, put a poll in the chat. I'm just kidding. We don't have to do this. Uh, but one of the most common places that I hear uh, old ideas is around meditation. Now, I'm pretty sure everyone in this meeting at one point in history has said or thought something like this. I can't meditate. I can't meditate. My brain does not sit still. And that is the that is the like one thing that I hear again and again and again. I can't do this. My brain doesn't get quiet. My brain doesn't do this thing. Well, I've got some bad news. That's the job of the brain. You know, I, I have kidneys and the responsibility of my kidneys is to filter out uh, toxins. I started talking about the kidneys without actually having an end goal. I'm like, what do my kidneys do? They clean the blood and stuff like that. I don't know. Uh, but that is their job. The purpose of my lungs is to expand and to contract, to collect air and to expel carbon dioxide. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but that is the purpose of the lungs. And unfortunately, the brain is an organ and the organ's purpose is to think. 
So it is impossible for me as a human being, not just an alcoholic, not just a drug addict, not just somebody who's deeply flawed and frequently wrong to come to meditation and, and sit in perfect stillness. It's just not possible. And that's what I thought meditation was. I thought meditation was coming to perfect stillness, sitting in perfect stillness, but I come to find out that's not what meditation is. Meditation, man, I didn't plan on going on this tangent this early, but here we are, off we go. Uh, meditation is far more about bringing my attention to a singular point. And then the mind will inevitably wander. And meditation is catching that my mind has wandered and coming back to that point of attention. A common way that, a, a simple way that people meditate is to watch our breath, to sit and watch as we breathe in and watch as we breathe out. And then we think, you know, what did I, do I need to get my groceries? And oh, what was I talking about to that? Like the brain will go. And meditation is not sitting in perfect stillness, watching as the breath comes in and watching as the breath goes out. Meditation is the mind wandering and me noticing and coming back in this instance to breath. Just like when I go to the gym, I do not go to the gym. I should be very transparent about this. I'll spend any time in the gym. That's not how I do. Uh, but that idea that like I don't just show up to the gym and look all buff and cut and ripped and toned. I cannot get in shape if there is not resistance. So I need weights that are heavy. I need to lift those weights and it is in lifting those weights that I gain that strength. And so it is in my mind wandering that I gain that resiliency in meditation. So meditation is, in my experience, the mind wandering and coming back to breath or to whatever the anchor is. Now, one of the things that I've commonly heard is that idea is of like meditation didn't mean meditation in the 1930s. If you looked up meditation, meditation meant um, it meant uh, thinking, it meant contemplating, it to meditate was to think. And what I want to say is there is some truth to that. If all I do is I look up meditation in the dictionary in the 1930s. But meditation was a far larger practice than simply in, as it was defined in the dictionary in the 1930s. So there's a book, it's called uh, Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And in the first 164 pages of the big book, only one book is specifically referenced. Uh, literally referenced. There have been some other books that, you know, were drawn upon, but one book that was specifically referenced is Varieties of Religious Experiences. Now, the, the Varieties of Religious Experiences written by a psychologist by the, uh, or psychiatrist by the name of William James, and he was exploring the phenomenon of a spiritual awakening, spiritual experiences. And in it, it is not a meditation book. He does not talk about meditation. He doesn't talk about meditation techniques. But in that book, he talks about a variety of spiritual traditions, a variety of spiritual teachers, a variety of other spiritual literature in which meditation was a practice. He talks about St. Teresa of Avila, and she had a, a meditative practice. And you can't talk about her without talking about her homie, St. John of the Cross. And he had a meditative practice. He talked about the Quakers. He even did reference uh, Buddhism and Hinduism uh, and, and the religion of Islam. And there are obviously meditative practices that have been within those faith traditions for centuries. He also uh, referenced this book. It's called Philothea or Introduction to the Devout Light life and uh it's by saint francis de sales and that doesn't matter but that book was published in the 16 or 1700s and that book was a book that was a series of guided meditations so if you come and you hear they didn't have guided meditations in the 1930s they did in the 1700s it did exist but one of the things I do want to acknowledge is the early AA members, the early members of the Oxford group, they weren't doing guided meditations and they weren't doing a lot of the uh, meditation practices that, you know, maybe we would see on this app or that app. What they were doing was a form of meditation that was known as two-way prayer. And there's a number of books uh, on two-way prayer. And man, I have it in my brain, but I, I believe 
it's a there's a book called what as man thinketh no or it's uh as man listens i believe somebody will correct me the thing is if i just say it confidently somebody will let me know what, that i'm wrong uh and in it it talks about uh a little about the oxford group and how they did meditation and how they would meditate and what they would do in their quiet time was it was not about getting rid of thoughts what it was about was listening to the voice of God beneath the thoughts. And that's what their meditative practice was about. And it was really interesting as I, as I read that book, it actually spoke about how if you're trying to get some guidance from God, and they use the term God, but we can use higher power, creator, spirit of the universe, whatever, whatever floats your boat, probably buoyancy. So if you wanna call God buoyancy, that works too. Um, what they were talking about there was this, was this idea of getting and receiving guidance. And if, if I was coming to that place of quiet time, that place of meditation, that place of stillness, and I was not receiving guidance, that usually meant that I had some inventory to do or I had an amends to make. And they, they use that sort of reference. Uh, and honestly, some of us know what it's like when we come to prayer or we come to meditation or, uh, or you go to meetings and you're trying to avoid a night step and uh, it seems like every topic is about amends or you come to that stillness and you have that twist in your gut and you know you owe that amends. And it's talking about that, that idea of like, man, if there is some action that I need to take, th that will come up during the meditative practice. So that was quite a tangent uh, for me just trying to read step 11 as it's written on page 59 or on the wall and I'm not even done yet. So I just like to go and, and meditation. It's not and, or, and actually while I'm still on this tangent, so then it only counts as one tangent if anyone's keeping track of all the tangents, it's only one. Uh, but if, if we're talking about this idea of prayer and meditation, not and, or, what I want you to know is that my sobriety did not take off until I really took step 11 as seriously as it needs to be taken. It, my life did not take off my my sense of joy, my sense of happiness, man, I wanted to kill myself in the rooms of 12 step until I started treating step 11 with the seriousness that it demands until I had a daily prayer, a daily meditation, and a daily evening review rocking and rolling in my life. That that is when my sobriety changed. That's when my life changed. That's when you know how some people find me annoying. Welcome, David. Uh, not David, he's, he's got a very high page tolerance, uh, but some people find me annoying. It's like, man, she's just full of joy. That did not happen. Woo! That did not happen until I took a step 11 with the daily rigor and the seriousness that for somebody of my type, it needed to be taken. with. That's when my life took off. And so what, I, what I'm reminded at is when I'm falling into those bedevilments that are spoken about on page 52, when I'm falling into that conscious separation of God or the delusion of conscious separation from God, what I mean by that is when the world starts getting a little prickly and the, when people stop doing the things that I think they need to do, I can come back to the 11th step. Now, of course, I got a pit stop on step 10 to see if there's something I got to clean up in the moment, but I can come to the, that 11th step to build that relationship through prayer and meditation. And for me to do that evening review process, to continue to clear that channel. So, so it says, uh, saw it through, I know I haven't even finished I haven't even finished step 11 as it's written on the thing. Who knows what today's talk will be? Sure as heck I didn't. All right, sought through prayer and meditation to improve. And the word that I'm going to pause on is improve. Because just like sought doesn't have an end date, improve doesn't have an end point. See, when I was newly sober, it said improve. When I was one year sober, it said improve. At five years sober, it said improve. At 14 and a little bit years sober, it says improve. I am not done. And again, I always want to reiterate, man, I, I couldn't stay well on one drink. I don't want to stay well on one spiritual experience. I always needed another drink, another hoot, another hit, another high. I want another experience. Now, some of you are married. And some of you know that idea of like, you don't want to improve your marriage to the point that at least you guys can stand living together. 
you want to continue to improve until it gets better and better and better. And that's like my relationship with God. Man, this is another tangent we're going on. J join me if you want. You don't have to join me. My tangents are consensual. You can just mute, mute the talk. Off we go. Uh, but I really come to this idea of a relational view of God. And there's a number of points in our book where it talks about we are building a relationship. We need a new relationship, a new attitude. What I am here to do is build a relationship. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna make a bit of a metaphor. I'm gonna compare the spiritual journey to Tinder. Uh, so if you need to write inventory on me, fair enough. And keep in mind, I will say that those of us who come to twelve step fellowships are usually not people who date. So uh, this might not be a perfect metaphor. We are usually people like, what's the joke? How do you know an alcoholic's on on a second date? They showed up in the driveway with their two garbage bags full of stuff. You know what I mean? It's not a U-Haul. I'm not functional enough for a U-Haul. I got two garbage bags because I got kicked out of treatment. You know, the, the blue of my grippy socks matched the blue of his eyes. I knew it was meant to be. It was true love. So that's typically how we come together. But you guys know what it's like. The second step is, is essentially just looking at, at a Tinder profile and believing that we're not being spiritually catfished. Do you know what I mean? The second step is all about believing there could be a power greater than myself. I don't know anything about that power. I haven't developed or cultivated a relationship with that power. All I'm doing is believing that it exists. Now, a bit of a confession is I'm not on Tinder, so I don't know which way that you swipe. The third step is a little like swiping yes. I don't know if that's right or left on God. It's a little about saying like, yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm ready for this thing. Now, I don't know about you guys. Again, I don't, uh, you know, I don't got my two garbage bags full of stuff. You know what I mean? We meant under a bridge. This is a true story. We meant under a bridge. So it's true love. Um, so I don't have a lot of dating under my belt. I got a lot of like, oh, poor decisions and a lot of inventory about that's right under my belt. But uh, you guys kind of know what it's like when you go on a first date or we can imagine what normal people are like on a first date feeling a little nervous and it's a little uncomfortable and I don't know about you guys when your sponsor first told you to pray oh it's a little awkward it's a little uncomfortable I'm a little self-conscious I feel like I'm talking to a wall and I'm watching my words and it feels awkward and that idea of meditating man I got those old ideas I try to sit in meditation and my mind's going everywhere and I I don't like it and it's it's uncomfortable see that's that's a little like that first kind of date experience, you know, early prayer, early meditation, early inventory, just starting on this spiritual way of life. Now, if I don't go on any other dates with this power, if I don't do anything to build a relationship, but we go on a second date two years later, I'm not going to feel any more connected. I'm not going to feel any more comfortable. If we go on a date once a year, I'm not gonna feel that much more connected or that much more comfortable. And what, what, what I'm talking about, or what's my point with this? My point with this is that time is not what builds the relationship. What builds the relationship with a power greater than myself is the same thing that builds a relationship with a human being. It is consistency. So those of you who are married, is it safe to say if you don't listen to your spouse, you're not gonna feel very, well, your spouse is not gonna feel very connected with you, might be sleeping on the couch, you know, that sort of thing. If we do not talk to our spouse, I'm not gonna feel very connected. And if I don't clear away the stuff between me, you know, those unspoken things that we have in the relationship, you know, if I don't clear away the fact that won't pick up his socks or put the toilet seat down or whatever that thing is. If I don't clear away those unspoken things in the relationship, I am not going to feel connected. And it takes consistency. So not with time, but with consistency. And the other thing that I've got to do with a spouse, with a partner, with a relationship is we've got to do things together. I've got to do things with this partner. I've got to do things with this spouse. We've got to be on this journey together. And so that's for me what, what the 12 steps are all about. So I just love the idea of like somebody coming to this meeting and oh, Paige was talking. What was she talking about? Step 11 and how that applies to Tinder, you know, just, ugh. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna get a strongly worded email after this thing. Like, and I will say I will take complaints, uh, which is different than criticisms. Like, I will take a full on complaint, but only by carrier pigeon. So uh, that's how I receive those carrier pigeon or four column inventory. So you could bring either or. But that's what the eleventh step is about. I'm seeking to improve to improve that relationship. And I can't have a good relationship with another human being if I don't speak to them, if I don't listen to them, if we don't clear away the things between us, and if we don't spend that time together and do things together and have experiences together, I'm not going to feel connected. And it's just that way for me with God. And so for me, the 11th step is not a once in a while. It's not a once a week thing. It is a daily Thing. And for those of you who are married, that same person who is so uncomfortable and so awkward that first date and I'm overthinking it and I'm stumbling over my words, that same person becomes that place of refuge, that person that you want to tell those things to, you want to share your life with. Man, something awful happens and you can't wait to tell your partner because they're going to offer that love and support and comfort. Something wonderful happens and you can't wait to tell your partner because ideally they're going to support and celebrate with you. That is what the 11th step for me is about, building that relationship. And so that's what I'm seeking to improve. There's no glass ceiling on this thing. I get to improve. It says improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Now, I'm... <laughs> And I'm like, I'm aware of the time. I think it, I might only talk about step 11 as it's written on page 59. Not doing great for time, but it'll be what it'll be. Uh, in So when we talk about the word conscious contact or the description of conscious contact, again, what we are trying to do here, at least what I'm trying to do here, is build this relationship. Now, in the second step, in step two, it's the whole chapter that is devoted and dedicated to step two is the chapter we agnostics. Now, the word agnostic, it's Greek in its etymological origins. What that means is it's a Greek. It's an originally a Greek word. And the root of the word. So when we break the word agnostic down, ag means without and gnosis means knowledge. So the word agnostic means without knowledge. And when we talk about without knowledge, what we're talking about is without knowledge of God. But one of the things I want to point out is when we talk about that, you know, without knowledge of God, the Gnostic, the Gnosis is not, you know, it's not the good old fashioned alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, I know. And if you have uh, ever been sponsored, you guys, maybe you, you've been the yeah, yeah, I know, or maybe you've heard the yeah, yeah, I know from sponsees, you know, when you're getting a spiritual suggestion again and again and again. You're getting it again because we're not taking it because we weren't listening. And what do we say? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's not an intellectual knowing. The gnosis, if you hear of books or texts or um, things that are no, uh, Gnostic in nature, it's a heart level experiential knowing. That's, that's what we're after, not the head knowing. So when we talk at the second step, we agnostic, it's not the chapter two agnostics for the agnostic, the agnostic afterward. It is the chapter we agnostics. And what that is saying is all of us, no matter our faith, our belief, our practices, all of us who come to the second step are those that do not have that heart level experiential knowing of God. And again, just to bring this, oh, David, I'm going to talk about you again. Um, Glasgow, not Jedi. Uh, just, I've yeah, got consent. Uh, actually, no, I've met both. I'm going to talk about both of them. Uh, I have met both of your wives. And I've, you know, got to know them a little bit. At the, sec at the second step, is it safe to say I know their spouses? But is it safe to say that both Davids have a different heart level knowing of their wives? Do you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Step two is just like, just say, admitting, admitting that Tinder exists or admitting that I'm not being Tinder catfished. But what I'm looking to do is build the relationship, that deeper, intimate, experiential relationship that they have with their spouses. That's what I'm looking to do. See, I had clearly, I mean, like, come, you'll be a part. This is, this is an all-inclusive thing and everyone will get thrown into the job. It'll be fun. Uh, 
but uh, at step two, it is without knowing. And at the second step, I am starting with belief, but I do not have that experiential knowing. Now, at step 11, what did I just read? It said to seek to improve our conscious contact with God. Now, the etymological root of conscious, it's completely different. It is Latin. So a coincidence? Probably not, because those things don't seem to happen. It's Latin in origin. And so con means with, and the shus or sire means knowing. So from the second step, I come from without knowing, I don't have any experience, this deep heart level knowing of God to step 11, I'm improving this with knowing, this deep heart level knowing of God. What is the purpose of steps three through 10? Well, I mean, really four through nine, but like just to, to tie that in a nice little bow, what are the steps that happen between step two to step 11? The purpose of those 12 steps is to clear away the stuff inside of me that is blocking me from that power. It is to clear away the things that are blocking me from having that experiential knowing of that power. And we know that this is true because at step 11, I'm improving my conscious contact, that with knowing relationship with God. And some of you guys know, as I talk about etymology, because I'm fun, this is last time Steve will ask me to fill in last minute. He's like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, but uh, when we talk about that deep heart level with knowing of God, I always want to talk about uh, Dr. Carl Jung. Now, Dr. Carl Jung, he gave us knowledge of what our solution is in 12 step. And the solution is the spiritual awakening, the spiritual experience. He gave Roland Hazard knowledge of, of that is what I need in order to recover from my illness. Now, there's this famous BBC interview of Dr. Carl Jung, because he was a, he's one of, he's probably the second most famous psychologist, psychiatrist in all of history. And there was this interview by the BBC. And in this interview, they asked him, they said, growing up, did you believe in God? And he says, yeah, growing up, I believed in God. And they said, do you believe in God now? And he says, no. And there's a pause. And he says, I've got no need for belief. And there's a pause. And he says, I know. That, that is what I'm after. See, step two is all about belief. Step Step 11 is all about that deep experiential knowing, growing and deepening that relationship. And it says, so sought to prayer meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Man, I'm going to break down that word understand. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, oftentimes we come and we hear, you know, or maybe we've said, God, as we understand him, I can't understand God. And if I could understand it, it couldn't be God. Well, I have a 1930s dictionary. Now, I don't have the unaffordable unofficial official 1930s dictionary i just have one because i'm really fun at parties <laughs> you know i'm like yeah let's bring out the dictionary Woo! you know like that's who i am and uh, i was working with this font and we looked up that word understand and in my 1930s dictionary one of the definitions of understand is to know through experience man, I can't tell you how excited I was when I found that in the dictionary. It just, I mean, it just lit me up. It's that idea of like, man, that's what I'm trying to do is I am after an experience. I'm not in, after an intellectual idea. I'm not after a belief. I'm after an experience. And I am like, as we understood him, another way to see it, as we experienced him, as we experienced this power. And it says praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And that's what I'm after. You see, in the third step, I got fired from the management position of my life. I got my spiritual, I don't think we have too many people from the UK, but I always like to say my spiritual pink slip or for those in the UK, my spiritual P45. I got fired from the management position of my life gross incompetence really i mean my life was unmanageable i was the one that was managing it man i ought to be fired you know i got 
fired from the management position of my life, but then I, I needed to be spiritually employed. So God's going to be my manager. I signed my spiritual uh, employment contract and I go and I work for God. And a lot of the things, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure I'm the only one here who gets in my head about things. Uh, I know, I know, I'm the only one who, you know, worries and frets. Oh, I can fret, you know, I'm a fretter. Uh, and I can add her on as we found me do for, for a big chunk of this talk. You know, I, I fret, I worry, I, you know, I, I build, I can, I on my own power can be filled with anxiety. But that is not, all the stuff I worry about is actually not my business. That's upper management. And I got fired from upper management. What is my business? What is my role? What is my responsibility? Is knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. That, that is my job. So my job is to seek knowledge of what God's will for me is and to ask or, and of course, to ask. And I'm Canadian, so I'll always say please. It's my Canadian sensibilities. Heather was watching the Olympic ceremony and she was like, it wasn't the one I thought it was. They just had the flags, but I saw the Canadian flag. So flags, uh, don't get me going on a flag tangent. I'll go. Uh, but it's that idea that like, I am to ask for that power, but also here's my responsibility. I got to clear away the channel between me and God or the channel ra rather than maybe between me and God, the channel through me. Uh, my responsibility is to clear away my resentments, my guilt, my shame, my fear, my selfishness, my self-centeredness, so that power can flow through me. So that power, so I have access to that power, which can which can work through me. Now, uh, in step ten, it says we've entered the world of the spirit. Our next function, this is on eighty four, is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. My next responsibility is to grow in understanding and effectiveness of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. That's what I'm trying to grow in and to be more effective in. And I got to do that through this daily process, the daily actions of these 12 steps. Now, I spent most of my time talking about just step 11 as it's on, as, as it's on page 59. Just real quick, let's pop over to page 85. And and because as we're talking about, you know, in step one, I come and I'm absolutely, utterly powerless. In the first step, I've got nothing, nothing that I can do about my physical allergy. You see, as soon as I put anything, and I'll just be transparent about me. As soon as I put anything mind altering in my system, it's like a little switch that goes off and it tells me more. I got this physical allergy. I can't do anything about that except don't drink, don't take the first drug. Don't do it. But if you're like me, you know, I can't not do it. You see, I got this mental obsession, this insane the thought that happens when I am as sober as I am today that compels me to take that first drink or that first drug. You see, I'm absolutely powerless over the obsession of the mind. I come to that first step and I come to realize that, man, there, that, that I am doomed to drink again. I am doomed to relapse again. That is my first step experience. I have no power. And I've got to turn to a power greater than myself. I come to the second step. And what we have a look at is we have a look at the bedevilments. And the bedevilments is pointing to that spiritual malady. I refer to the spiritual malady as a, as a conscious sense of separateness from God. That feeling of disconnection from God. Man, I don't know what that is when I get here. You know what I mean? I didn't show up to 12 step and say, you guys, I'm really bedeviled today. I am just riddled with this conscious separation from a power greater than myself. No, I am just filled with anxiety, filled with self feeling of uselessness, restless, irritable, discontent. That is how I feel. And in the second step, it illuminates, man, there's nothing that I could do to make that go away. And I need a power greater than myself. And step two, can I believe that there is one? In the third step, I come to feel or I come to see that what is driving that conscious sense of separation from God is selfishness and self-centeredness. And the kicker is my selfishness and self-centeredness is driving that conscious separation from God. It's this pain in the butt feedback loop is I'm separate from God. So all I can do is think about me. But the more I think about me, the more I feel the separateness from God. And I come to find out that there is nothing that I can do about this. I need a power greater than myself. And now I, I pick up the pen. I get to work. I come to that fourth step. 
And man, I got these resentments. And when you know, there's nothing I could do about them. I couldn't wish them away any more than alcohol. And I need a power greater than myself to flow into my life, to begin to have that fourth calm experience where I see that I was wrong. I can't get rid of my fears. Again, that same thing. I need a power greater than myself. I need to rely on this power to overcome this fear. I develop a sex ideal. So I'm not dating men who live under bridges. Now that's not a judgment of them. I was also living under a bridge. Uh, you know, I, I need a sex ideal and I can't live up to those sex ideals on my own power. I need that power to flow through me. I can spend time with God and another human and being in that fifth step. And I really illuminate my defects of character, which are the same as the shortcomings, which for me are the same as the exact nature of my wrongs. And I can't get rid of them on my own power. I need a power greater than myself. See, what we're about is about building a relationship with power. There are people that say this thing is about power. And I think for me, that's only half the truth. It is a relationship. It is a relationship with power. And so page 85, it says much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build this relationship with, doesn't have to be him but with something that has all knowledge and power. And I am without strength and I am without knowledge and I am, listen, I am regularly directionless. Right now I'm in uh, the outskirts of Chicago and people be like, oh yeah, there's there's uh, Plano and then there's Sugar Grove and then there's Bristol. And I'm like, I don't know geographically where I am. Like I, is Chicago that way? I don't know where we are. You know, there's a lot of corn. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the land, not land of Lincolns, I'm in the land of David, as I've been saying, land of David. And yeah, and so go Bears. Uh, see what I did there? Sports. And I'm sorry if you're from Wisconsin, I didn't mean it. Because uh, I, I know that rivalry. Uh, so like, what I'm talking about is I had no direction. But I come and I take these actions and I begin to build a relationship with power that flows through me. And man, if I don't have these things, if I can see man on my own, I can't do it. But I need something to flow and work through me to do the heavy lifting. Why wouldn't I want to? And it says, to some extent, we have become God conscious. So I've begun to have this with knowing experience. We have begun to develop this vital life-giving sixth sense and it says but we must go further and that means more action oh man it's almost like this whole thing is in action it's almost like that what we have is a program of action i was really hoping that we'd have a resting on our laurels a laurel is what they would give olympians uh when they got their gold like back in the day it was a wreath like a crown that was like a celebration that's on my brain because some people upstairs are just jazzed about the olympics so uh, I want to like rest out my accomplishments. No, this is a daily, daily way of life. And it says step 11 suggests prayer and meditation, not and or like I was saying. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. And again, as I was saying, when people are offering that uh, meditation didn't mean meditation, man, there was meditation abound, but often it was hidden under the word of prayer, prayer of quiet, prayer of recollection, prayer of remembrance these meditative techniques that were hidden under the name prayer. And it says better men than we are using it constantly. And here's what matters, it works. This thing works. If we have the proper attitude and work at it, that is what is asked of me. And so um, just in respect of time, I am gonna go very quickly and summarize what my experience is. But what I've come to find out is, not what I've come to find out, what I've come to experience. Man, it's the people who have who have what I want. And by the way, when I mean have what I want, it is not what they drive. It is not what they live. It is the light that is on in their eyes. You know, the people who are able to treat others with kindness and compassion and humility, the people, at least in my life, who are on fire for this thing, they became demonstrations of this power. And man, I wanted what they had. And what that meant is I had to do what they did. And so at the top of page 86, it gives us directions for evening review. And some of us, I mean, I have this defect where I want to be pedantic. Pedantic is like where I'm focused on particular details just so I can be right and have a sense of moral superiority. But what I want you to know is I don't care if you call evening review step 10, even though it's technically in the step 11 section, I don't care if you call it step 11. And actually that is why I call it evening review because I am out of the debating society because I can try to get myself a little boosted better than ego for what I call it. 
but what I call it does not matter. It's whether or not I do it. And the people who were doing it in Calgary, Alberta, that's where I'm actually from, uh, around the time that I was actually beginning to take this work as seriously as, as it demands to be taken for somebody with an illness of my type, somebody who is dying around the room, somebody who is was absolutely dying of this illness, the people who had what I wanted, the people who were on fire for this thing, put pen to paper in their evening review. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. But what I will say is that's how I do it. Because <laughs> that's how they did it. You know what I'm saying? The people who were full of this thing. I remember I was at a camp out one year and there was this gentleman. He didn't even bring a tent. And he was like, it doesn't say to do this. And he was miserable. You know, one of those people where it's like, buddy, back away from the campfire. You're like kindling. Like, the more you're going to go, you know. I didn't want, I'm like, cool, you don't, you just do it in your head. It's a fine if people do it in their head. In fact, an interesting thing about the, off I go on tangents, mid tangents, an, an interesting thing about that idea of meditation is um, uh, Father Ed Dowling, I believe, if I'm wrong, where's Howard? He's going to correct me. I think he left. Okay. Uh, I will not be corrected. I might be corrected. I believe it was Father Ed Dowling who approached Bill Wilson and he's like, Bill, my guy, my homie, that's verbatim. That's how the conversation went. Bill was talking about that like that all the time. It was like, what up? What up my Father Ed? Woo. Uh, and he said, uh, Father Ed Dowling uh, said, did you know that a lot of what you've described is a lot like St. Ignatius of Loyola's the spiritual exercises? And Bill was like, nope, don't know what that is. Didn't know, no. And so again, that idea in the spiritual exercises, there's something known as the examine, which is an, a meditative evening review of the day. And it's just that idea that meditation did exist in the 1930s and, be, and well before. And no, it was not influenced by it, just two ideas running in parallel. But here's what I found. When it comes to evening review, what has been the most helpful thing for somebody like me is when I have a look at whether when I was resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid, the most helpful thing for me to, that I've done is that I've taken those things, those resentments, those fears, those dishonesties, the selfishness, and I have taken them through the columns. For me, it does no good to use the columns in step four and then to drop them until my, I burn my life to the ground and I gotta pick them up. And, no, I wanna use those same columns in step four that I use in step 10 that I use in the 11th step in evening review. And what I've come to find out is that evening review provides a beautiful and wonderful safety net for somebody like me. It matches what, what, uh, what we look at in the 10th step. We look for the same things, resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. That's what we're looking for. And I will miss things because I am human. And what I do, I get to do is I will uh, be able to catch them when I miss them. You see, the, the spiritual way of life does not demand perfection. It does demand action on a daily basis, but the spiritual way of life meets me where I'm at and takes me where I need to go. And what I will just say is, Paige, I didn't get a chance. Oh, what I will, uh, nope, okay. I thought I was landing the plane. Nope, whoop. we were vectoring around the airport. Did not land that plane real quick. Uh, in the original manuscript, when it said, when we retire at night, in the original manuscript, that was a morning suggestion. It didn't say when we retire at night. So I always tell my sponsees, I don't care when you do evening review. It does not need to be in the evening, just as long as you do. And then on page uh, 87, where it says, be quick to see where religious people are right and accuse of what they have to offer. There are directions on, uh, you know, throughout 85, 86, 87, and so on, that tell me how I can begin this prayer and meditation practice, how I can review my day on a daily basis. But then that gives me spiritual license to grow and explore and have fun, always rooted and grounded in this, in this work, in this way of life. But man, for me, it's meant to be fun. Listen, you, if you don't have date night with your spouse every once in a while, you know, do some fun stuff, seek and explore. And so that's, that's what this has been about for me. Step 11, it's a daily way of life, but it has brought my life more joy than I could have ever imagined. So I went way over my time. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, guys.